What you see in this video is not a healthy forest. Here, from the vantage of the air, it may look beautiful, peaceful, tranquil. But this land is, at best, only a forest that is healing. I know, this is my forest, and it was clear-cut some 30 years ago, long before I ever bought it. And since I have acquired it, my goal for this land has been to allow it to become whole and to heal. And here, miles away in the Nova Scotia Highlands, we see another winterscape of what might appear to be healthy forest. But all you see down there are two crops of a tree plantation, one of deciduous trees and the other of conifers. And were you to walk through that woodland, you would find it lacking in the deep forest species of flora and fauna that tell us when a woodland is whole and healthy. There is no room left for healthy woods because this is their destiny all throughout the maritime provinces and especially right here in Nova Scotia. Because places like this coniferous tree plantation on the left and the deciduous tree plantation on the right never truly have a chance to become healthy and wholesome woodlands, to properly shelter and feed wildlife or capture carbon and hold it, there is so little space for any woods at all, because in the end, their destiny is this. Thanks to the wonders of modern technology, it is becoming much harder for the forestry cartel to keep its deeds secret. Satellite imagery readily accessible by anyone through sources such as Bing, Google, or viewable as three-dimensional imagery in the most up-to-date flight simulators such as the Microsoft Flight Simulator, reveal a landscape and a forest that is defined by clear cuts, just as you see here, and whether on the northeast or the southwest side of this province, excepting in those few areas defined as wilderness preserves or national parks, and among those private landowners who have determined to allow their forest to regrow in a healthy, natural, and complete way, this is what you'll find. A landscape of broken woodlands and broken ecologies, defined first and above all else by clear cuts and tree plantation activities. But the situation is not entirely hopeless. Indeed, the Department of Lands and Forestry and our government deserves praise for taking marked steps for making a move toward protecting true biodiversity. The provincial government has introduced the Biodiversity Act, also known as Bill No. 4. It's shown here, and you can find the link to the act and read it for yourself, listed down below. It's only the equivalent of about a dozen pages long, and is written in such a way that anybody can understand it. It's not legalese. I've read through the entire Biodiversity Act several times, and as a landowner and a forest owner, I am very pleased by what I have seen in the Biodiversity Act. It makes provision for the protection of Nova Scotia's biodiversity, both on crowns and private lands. And it also provides for the protection of private landowners, for if they are financially impacted by the Biodiversity Act, it authorizes compensation. The bill looks to be fair, balanced, with a determination to protect the environment both for this present generation and those in the future. So it came as a surprise when, in mid-March of 2021, this ad appeared in the Chronicle Herald, the Halifax newspaper. The ad reads, and I quote, Calling all private landowners. New legislation will give the government of Nova Scotia broad and unprecedented authority over your land. If passed, the new act will restrict what you can and can't do with fines up to $1 million. Agriculture, Christmas tree growing, housing and road construction, forest management, Farming livestock and development are all activities that will be impacted. A better balance is needed. All stakeholders must be consulted. Learn more about what's planned for your land. Visit nslegislature.ca to read Bill 4, introduced on March 11, 2021. Act now before it's too late. Ask your MLA to voice your concerns about this new legislation. And then, the strangest thing, because just below there, the ad notes that it is from the Concerned Private Landowner Coalition. And then the ad features some warm and fuzzy pictures. On the top left, a picture of a mature Acadian forest. On the top right, somebody cutting a small tree for firewood. A picture on the lower left that appears to be a grape harvest in progress for some strange reason. Not exactly sure what that's supposed to do with forestry. And on the lower right, what seems to be a family either walking through a Christmas tree farm or a clear cut in very early stages of regrowth. But it's this part above that's particularly bizarre. This ad purports to be from the Concerned Private Landowner Coalition. Now, I'm a landowner, 
and a forest owner in Nova Scotia. And I have never heard of this organization. So when I saw the ad, I immediately did a search on Google, on Bing, and on Facebook, and could find absolutely no evidence of the existence of this group. Increasingly perplexed, I then messaged friends and posted requests for information on several groups regarding natural science, forests, and forestry that I'm a part of, and still could find nothing about this group. But then, Information Morning, a CBC News program, aired an interview a couple days later with Jeff Bishop, the Executive Director of Forest Nova Scotia. It was, to say the least, revealing. I'll just play you a clip of the interview. Okay, but does this group even exist, the Concerned Private Landowner Coalition? It, it, it's not a formal organization. No, okay. you're, you're right, uh, Preston. We didn't feel that we had to, to go that far, if you will. If you would like to hear the entire interview for yourself, I've noted the link below. In case you didn't catch that, let me quote. Jeff Bishop, the executive director of Forest Nova Scotia, said, It, it, it's not a formal organization, no. You're right, Preston. We didn't feel that we had to go that far, if you will. In the middle of a CBC radio broadcast, the executive director of Forest Nova Scotia admitted that he or the organization had made up this group, corporation, Facebook group for all I know, the Concerned Private Landowner Coalition. It doesn't exist. This group is a fraud. Their act is fraudulent. They are so scared of the Biodiversity Act that they are willing to deceive the public over it. And now that this is established, among the many thoughts going through my mind is, why is this not being investigated and prosecuted? I have a sneaking suspicion that if I made up an organization and published ads under it with the intent of manipulating political action, I would be held accountable for it. Why is Forrest Ness not being held accountable for this? Now, I have a fair bit of background in communication, in particular rhetorical communication. No, let's just be straight up. I have a lot of background with rhetorical communication. And this ad is clearly an attempt at rhetorical communication, in particular it is clearly intended to inflame fears among the general public, especially rural dwellers who may in any way be involved with agriculture, Christmas tree growing, housing and road construction, forest management, farming livestock, and quite literally any other kind of development or economic activity. Basically, it's intended to set pretty much anybody who lives in rural Nova Scotia on the alert and present the Biodiversity Act as this draconian gesture intended to take over people's land and prevent them from making a living from it or even enjoying it. It uses what is clearly and can only be defined as inflammatory terms, calling all private landowners, great big blue caps. New legislation will give the government broad and unprecedented authority over your land. Frame that evil government is sinister. A better balance is needed. Doesn't really say what it is or why it is, just apparently it's needed. And above all, act now before it's too late. It wasn't enough to make that one bold or all in caps. No, that one got its own bright blue highlighted section. But the thing is, it wants to present itself as an ad that was brought forth by a small grassroots Nova Scotia group, this concerned private landowner coalition, which doesn't exist. It was a front for the activities of Forest Nova Scotia. To put it bluntly, Forest Nova Scotia lied about the origin of this ad and through it deliberately attempted to set off and inflame fears among the general public, especially rural dwellers. And what they found so threatening that they had to take such an action was the Biodiversity Act. Now I may just be a chicken fried southern dumpling country lawyer, which I'm not. My actual background is behavior science, psychology, and earth sciences. But I can tell you this, in the realm of behavior science we have an adage, the truth is always in the behavior. And if somebody, whether that somebody is an individual or an entity, feels it's necessary to hide their identity, they have something to hide. I mean, let's be straight up. If Forest Nova Scotia really had legitimate concerns that they felt the general public would also be concerned about in regard to the Biodiversity Act, they would have simply posted that ad under their own names. But they didn't. They wanted to incite fear. And I am certain that they recognized that to do that, they could not be associated with this ad. Because a lot of people around the province are very concerned these days about our dwindling forests chopped away, clear cut away more and more year after year. And as those habitats go, so dwindle the numbers of many species, many of which are now endangered. 
Endangered to the point that Nova Scotia naturalists recently had to take their own Department of Lands and Forestry to court to get them to act to enforce the protection of these wildlife and these ecosystems. So why would Forest and Est run this ad? Because Forest Nova Scotia is the propaganda wing of the Nova Scotia Forestry Cartel, and they have a direct invested interest in combating attempts to protect biodiversity. Protecting biodiversity would really work against the interests of unfettered clear-cutting activity. And much, if not most, of this activity is not conducted by small private landowners. It is conducted by the forestry cartel giants, such as Westfor. Very much on crown lands, but sometimes private lands. If forest ecosystems are protected, and the endangered species that the Department of Lands and Forestry has neglected to conserve for generations are protected, such as the Nova Scotia mainland moose, of which there, it is estimated there are only about 200 left, then the corporations and entities they serve will not be able to get free and virtually unfettered access to crown and private land throughout the province. And God forbid there should be something like environmental responsibility. Now, at roughly the same time that Forrest and S published their propaganda ad calling all private landowners appeared in the Chronicle Herald, a document by Stephen Isaac Cole, a lawyer, woodlot owner, and partner at H.C. Haynes, the largest timber broker in the province, and thus a significant stakeholder in the present forestry system. You can read about him here in this Global News article entitled, PC Public Accounts Member Calls on NS Forestry Transition Chair to Answer Questions, and you can find him noted in many other places in the media. Was also making contact with the province's MLAs. He sent this lengthy message, practically a lecture really, out to the province's MLAs at roughly the same time, almost as if it was a coordinated effort. I apologize for the yellow highlighting. I read his entire document and, and highlighted those areas I found to be interesting. To see the entire document that he sent to the MLAs, look below in the description and follow the link. Using communication tactics, which would be common to any rhetorician, he begins an eight-page tirade against the Biodiversity Act. It begins with a statement that he is concerned because he's a 30-year member of Forest and S and a resident woodlot owner, and occasionally through the document also notes that he has been a practicing lawyer, even citing his work in prosecuting or defending cases at the Supreme Court level. These are steps meant to establish character and authority. It's not that that I have a problem with, though. That would be something anybody using rhetorical or persuasive speech would do. Though he also devotes a few sentences claiming that he's been demonized, called various names by zealous environmentalists. Uh, I'll just read what he says in section 112. But I, for one, have had a belly full of private woodlot owners like me being demonized online and elsewhere as greedy people having an agenda to decimate our forests. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Among other things, my forest work has been characterized online and elsewhere as assaulting Mother Earth. I decided some time ago not to engage the abstract pontifications of these self-ordained environmentalists. I was better off saving my breath to cool my porridge. It may have happened, I don't know, but I do know that I am an environmentalist and I know a great many other environmentalists who have a great deal of respect for woodlot owners who take steps to protect the biodiversity of their land. So what exactly his point is? Well, my opinion is that his point is to demonize those persons who would be for this biodiversity act. But my concern is, and you can see this for yourself if you read his document, is that his understanding of forest ecology and biodiversity is that it's something that comes out of a managed forest. Where the reality is, which we are learning very rapidly, especially given developments in the last 20 years in the realms of mycology, the understanding of the fungal relationships between trees, the wood wide web, the crucial roles of soil, flora, and fauna in the sequestration of atmospheric carbon, and the simple fact that forests do much better at protecting biodiversity when they're left to be forests, when they aren't managed. Because the reality is we humans, apart from getting trees to do what we want, such as growing fruit and wood, we humans are really coming to understand that forest ecosystems are amazingly complex and our understanding of them is at its infancy. And our efforts to manage them, if anything, have proven mainly to hinder biodiversity. He doesn't really seem to quite get this. And he uses unusual terms, terms that in all my studies, and even after consulting with some colleagues after reading his document, nobody's still quite sure what he's referring to, such as robust forest and green forest, which, insofar as I can discern, a green forest means an unmanaged forest. You're welcome to correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen. 
And a robust forest refers to a managed forest. In particular, it seems like it might refer to what most people would refer to as a tree plantation. And the general concept is that these forests can be grown, whereby they will capture carbon and then cut. And then he talks about using the forest as pulpwood and biomass. But the simple reality is that forests do capture carbon, and they do hold it in the wood. But the reality is mature and old growth forests are much more efficient at capturing and holding carbon than new forests. Mature and old growth trees with well-established root systems, well networked with each other through their fungal partners, are quite effective at moving nutrients and simply offer more space mathematically to hold carbon. If a forest is cut, it can no longer hold carbon as effectively, and that is just a matter of established scientific fact. And some of the things he mentions doing, such as developing forests as biomass. Well, biomass is the opposite of green energy. Apart from the fact that biomass plants are notoriously inefficient, the simple fact is that wild trees do indeed capture carbon. When they are cut and burned, that carbon is released. Using a forest for so-called green energy, for biomass, is the equivalent of carbon capture and release. These are also well-established scientific facts, and yet they are absent in this document. In fact, I believe that the ultimate goal of this document is defined quite well in Section 1, Area 14, A, B, and C, where he writes, In my view, there are three critical components for us to grow that robust forest with substantial forestry punch to combat climate change, which will also create greater biodiversity. A. Secure and maintain the trust and confidence of rural, small-town Nova Scotians. They have been doing much of the heavy lifting and improving our forests. They have the practical knowledge and infrastructure, truck drivers, heavy equipment operators, forestry contractors, mill workers, etc. B. Continue the aggressive government funding started by Stephen McNeil in 2020 and for which he deserves considerable credit for brush saw treatments, other forestry treatments, and enhanced road construction assistance. And C. Secure and maintain long-term viable and sustainable markets for low-grade forest products and specifically notes pulpwood and biomass and sawmill residuals. B and C seem to be the really crucial areas of interest here. Wanting to maintain the so-called forestry treatments where the forestry cartel goes into forests and cuts away brush and what they consider to be weed trees with the idea of opening space between the trees and basically turning forests into tree plantations, tree farms, which are by their very nature contrary to biodiversity because the flora and fauna that need a deep forest setting need a closed canopy. That closed canopy keeps the land cool, it retains water, it helps shield the forest against forest fires, and opening up such forests just creates a parkland, a very different kind of ecosystem, but one which is really desirable for the forestry industry as we have it. And Section C, I believe, refers to maintaining forestry access roads, which, as we've covered in other videos, is detrimental to many of the species of flora and fauna. They open up remote lands to poachers and hunters when those animals otherwise need to be free from pressure, and even just making woodlands more readily accessible for things like hikers and ATVs can ultimately lead to the damaging of more remote woodlands where sensitive flora, fungi, and lichens grow. This is why in many national parks there are rules that hikers have to stay on trails in more remote areas to avoid long-term damage to sensitive ecosystems. The bottom line is that Stephen Cole's lecture, I guess we'll call it, to the MLAs, well, it is at best biodiversity framed through the lens of forestry. But insofar as I can see, it really doesn't have all that much to do with anything any ecologist, any biologist, nor any conservationist is going to recognize as good science. We could go a lot more into Stephen Cole's letter to the MLAs, but it is lengthy and this video is already about 20 minutes long. So I'm just going to jump ahead to page 6 out of the 8 pages and bring you to Stephen Cole's own words in section C on his tirade, lecture, whatever, on the regulations. Here, Cole is viciously critiquing the Department of Lands and Forestry, which from the perspective of most conservationists I know around this province has really been profoundly on the side of industrial forestry. But I'll just read you what he says. It's right under the red highlights. The standard response from senior leadership at DLF is that the regulations will be developed after the legislation has become law. I am sorry, but in this day and age of openness and transparency, that kind of answer is just not good enough. And I, and I have to tell you, <laughs> I mean, this is from a guy who's clearly writing on behalf of the very same interests that Forest Nova Scotia has and 
as he is actually writing about transparency and openness, Forest Nova Scotia created a full page ad that they did not have the guts to take credit for. They attributed it to an organization that doesn't exist, one they simply made up, purporting to represent the concerned private landowners of Nova Scotia. It's kind of a tragic comedy. I mean, I can only conclude that either these guys just are not very good at misleading the public, or they just can't really be bothered to get their act together. Maybe they don't feel that there are any meaningful consequences for them. There is yet one more section that should be addressed from Stephen Cole's lecture to the MLAs. In section four, the conclusion immediately following shown here, and its language is very important, thus I've also highlighted it in red. It reads, and I quote, Whenever government decides to get serious about maximizing the enormous natural filtration capacity of our forests to combat accelerated climate change, I would gladly take a seat at the round table. No one can escape the grip of climate change, but that round table must include meaningful representation from agriculture, forestry, fishing, aquaculture, mining, First Nations, respected environmentalists, land development, energy, construction, and others. Poisonous, false narrative rhetoric will not be welcomed. That last line is particularly intriguing and should in fact be interpreted as especially alarming. In effect, what Stephen Cole is saying is that among those respected individuals and organizations which he has suggested bringing together, nobody with a narrative that someone deems poisonous is going to be accepted. Of course, the question is, who determines what is a poisonous narrative? From my experience, from what I've seen from Forrest and S., a poisonous narrative is one that does not go with the narrative that they want to promote. That it's perfectly good and acceptable to clear-cut forests en masse. That the ecosystem and biodiversity are pretty well just fine. That everybody's doing good and the last thing that we need is more regulation. And I would venture to say that perhaps the forestry industry should continue to police itself. Poisonous, false narrative rhetoric will not be welcomed. Who indeed will decide that? Will it be persons like a man who does not understand the difference between forestry and forest ecology? Will it be an organization perfectly willing to falsify the existence of a group to hide its attempts to sway the public against the Biodiversity Act? I think I know where the poisonous narrative comes from, and I suspect I know in advance who it is that organizations such as Forest and S and individuals like Stephen Cole would not like at that round table. And those are the very persons and entities that we absolutely must have there. Those without vested financial interest, those whose interest is science, conservation, and a green and healthy world for tomorrow. But all I can tell you folks is that this is Forest Nova Scotia and Stephen Cole, partner at the largest timber broker in the province, both acting behind the scenes to stop the Biodiversity Act. And with science that bad, and a blatant con job of an ad in the Chronicle Herald, well, that to me is a pretty good indicator that neither Stephen Cole nor Forrest and S have messages worth listening to. And I, as a Nova Scotia landholder and forest holder, who has never even heard of the Concerned Private Landowners Coalition, hope indeed the Biodiversity Act becomes law. And I ask you to join me in contacting your MLA and letting them know that you too would like Bill Number 4, the Biodiversity Act, to become law. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like.